Greetings from the 11th session of the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, UNTOC, in Vienna, Austria. I'd like to start by thanking you and ODC for inviting us to participate. I'm Jeremy McDermott, the co-founder and co-director of Insight Crime. We're a think tank based out of Medellin, Colombia and Washington, DC, which studies organized crime and citizen security in Latin America and the Caribbean. We specialize in field research, walking the ground and speaking not only to authorities, but civil society, local stakeholders, and even the criminals themselves. Over the last five years, we've done field work across the Amazon region. Uh, and I'd like to share some observations aimed at the involvement of transnational organized crime in this important region of the world, and how we feel that the international community can get yet more involved in the struggle against environment crime here. There are um, eight nations that encompass the Amazon region of South America. Some like Guyana are almost entirely carpeted in Amazon forest. However, the biggest nation by far is of course Brazil. And then moving clockwise, we have Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, Guyana, Suriname, and French Guyana. Deforestation in this region is running at, at well over 10,000 square kilometers a year. That's the size of Lebanon being lost annually. Using the example of Bolivia here, um, which has used community approaches as well as internationally approved legislation to contain environment crime, we can see four main drivers behind deforestation. The first is land grabbing, mainly for agricultural purposes. Um, the second, illegal logging, which often works in tandem with land grabbing. The third is illegal mining, mainly of gold. Fourth, is the drug trade, mainly that of cocaine. And the last two, mining and drugs, not only contribute to deforestation, but also poison soil and water sources with chemicals used in the processing. And then to add to these um, four elements, there is also, of course, the illegal trade in fauna, which we'll come on to again in a second. Starting with land grabbing and deforestation, the setting of fires is one of the easiest and most destructive ways of clearing huge stretches of jungle and forest. And these fires often rage out of control. This graphic shows the scale of such fires over recent years um, and gives you an idea of the immense damage that they're causing. Now, at first glance, this seems to be largely um, local criminal dynamics. Um, but the international community can be vigilant and see if the agricultural projects that farm this usually illegally acquired land are used by or sold to international companies. Or if the products being produced like soybean or meat from cattle farming are entering the international food chains. Making it known that any international companies participating in this destruction in any way will face consequences, may go a long way to acting as a deterrent and supporting the efforts of the Amazon nations as they confront this form of environment crime. Turning to logging, now as well as the logging that occurs during general land clearance, there's also the search for fine woods that have a high value on international markets, balsa wood, used in wind turbines, for example, or mahogany used to make musical instruments or high quality furniture are just two examples. And here, the timber mafias that cut, move and trade um, these valuable woods have local, national and international elements involved and are therefore vulnerable to international pressure. Turning to gold, as gold prices have climbed in recent years, so inevitably has the illegal extraction of gold. Here in this um, chart, we can see Colombian gold production figures showing how the market um, mirrors 
uh, or grows in tandem with rising prices. In Colombia, we found that drug trafficking organizations, guerrilla groups, and other non-state armed groups added gold to their criminal portfolios, providing yet another layer of criminal earnings for them and another set of challenges for the, for the Colombian government, um, which has had to take it in its stride as it fights some of the most sophisticated transnational organized crime syndicates in the world. Flipping across the border into Venezuela, which is suffering under international sanctions and desperate for hard currency, a new wave of criminal groups uh, working with corrupt officials have spread across the Orinoco mining arc shown here, um, especially in the state of Bolivar. And they are mining for gold with little respect for the environment uh, and um, little uh, due diligence or care um, being exercised by the Venezuelan state. So this is not only an environmental crime challenge, but it's given birth to a new generation of criminal groups, which are providing serious national security challenges to the Venezuelan people. And um, working in the different direction we saw in Colombia, where drug trafficking organizations have moved into environment crime, here we have environment crime organizations, principally those involved in gold, now beginning to diversify into drug trafficking and other illicit economies. Oh. Now, the vast majority of gold coming out of the Amazon region is being exported abroad. And here, responsibility must be assumed by the international community to ensure that any gold shipments can prove their origin and an eco-friendly extraction process. And simply having some accompanying official documentation does not absolve international buyers of asking some tough questions. And when we look at the, the Amazon's illegal gold mining chain, we see multiple opportunities for the international community to take on a greater role in policing and prevention, working in tandem and in cooperation with South American nations. Here we can see a multitude of pressure points at all levels in the supply chain, not only for gold leaving South America, but also the money traveling back, which is part of a huge volume of illicit financial flows. Um, from a variety of different illicit economies, not just environment crime. Now, turning to the drug trade, the, responsible of the, the responsibility of the international community here needs, needs no repetition. And obviously, a great deal of international attention um, is dedicated to fighting the illegal narcotics business. However, new approaches are clearly needed here as coca production, the raw material for cocaine, is at a record high, with more than 2,000 tons of cocaine now being produced every year. We also need to be aware that one of the cornerstones of the international anti-narcotics programs here in, in, in Latin America focus um, on crop eradication efforts. And not only have these been largely unsuccessful, they have in many cases served only to push coca cultivation and cocaine production deeper into the Amazon forest. Finally, we come to the trafficking of fauna. And as an illustration, um, here we have a list of the 10 most trafficked species from Colombia. Involvement in this um, aspect of environment crime comes with minimal risk of jail time and very high profits. And these are, these are pushing certain Amazon species to the brink of, of extinction. There's some really good work being done here, particularly among civil, uh, civil society actors, to raise awareness. But there's still much more the international community can do here. Now, the next time you're sat in your doctor's waiting room admiring the fish tank, um, ask yourself, are the beautiful fish contained within 
illegally trafficked from the Amazon. They may well have been. Now, finally, I want to take a brief look at the actors behind deforestation and environment crime. Now, as in the drug trade, there's a danger that we, the international community, are focusing too much of our limited resources on the wrong parts of the network or the wrong links in the chain. Now, the majority of people involved in environment crime participate as the labor force that you can see here in the outer ring. Those who set the fires, cut down the trees, um, uh, manage the dredges um, that extract, uh, that, uh, extract gold from, from alluvial deposits. These people earn the least in the supply chain. Yet, this is where much of the limited law enforcement effort has traditionally been directed. Moving to the second ring, the non-state armed groups rightly attract a great deal of attention as they present national security threats for, for many of these Amazon nations. Um, within this region, most of these non-state armed groups or NSAGs began life as drug trafficking organizations and they have diversified into environmental crime. Um, however, we think that it's the central two rings or elements in the network where the international community should concentrate its support um, of the Amazon nations in efforts to contain environment crime. These are the corrupting elements that drive the trade and subcontract the other links in the chain or elements in the network in this, in this illegal industry. Now, as with the cocaine industry, which has been well studied and documented, the networks involved in environment crime and eco-trafficking are multinational. They tend to rely more on corruption than violence, although they have not proven shy in assassinating environment ac environmental activists and community leaders. International governments are now increasingly naming and shaming and putting sanctions on corrupt officials involved in, involved in drug trafficking, human rights abuses, or money laundering. It's time to add environment crime to that list. We must deepen and broaden investigations into the players in these top two rings, the center of these networks, that act as bridges to the international markets, um, that conduct corruption at high level in state institutions, and the criminal entrepreneurs that exploit the legal loopholes and make the lion's share of the profits. And they tend not to live in some jungle town in the Amazon. We must step up our due diligence. Just because a consignment of timber or gold has some official paperwork with it doesn't mean we mustn't ask the tough questions and seek to trace back more about the provenance and origin of these consignments. As with much of the transnational criminal world, the profits from environment crime are often earned outside the source countries in South America. And this again is where the international community can and must do more. All of the international tools used against the drug trade can be adapted against the transnational organized crime networks involved in environment crime. This is too often looked upon as a minor crime even though the consequences are potentially more catastrophic for the world and its people than the abuse of narcotics. And we'll throw it open if anyone's got any, any questions. We've got plenty of time. I galloped through that. Um, and we've also got, um, I don't know if we've got uh, any stuff coming through on the WhatsApp channels, but let's see if anyone's got any questions here. Yes, please. Uh, is there any engagement with indigenous communities with these initiatives? Oh, uh, I mean, on the part of insight crime, no. Um, but is there, um, particularly on the part of local government and international institutions, absolutely. Um, and uh, it depends on the country again. Um, but many of uh, the initiatives and engagements that started 
against the narcotics trade can easily be built upon and adapted. And I think actually this is the time to do exactly that. Um, as you probably know that in Latin America um, and now Colombia and Mexico are perfect examples, you know, the idea of the war on drugs is simply being rejected. Um, and they don't want to hear about uh, repression. They don't want to hear about decertification. Um, whereas a lot of the work on the ground that's been done um, uh, against um, narcotics and, uh, and the communities affected, I think can be quite swiftly um, um, adapted because many of them also have gold deposits um, as deforestation. Uh, so um, there is a huge geographic overlap. So I absolutely think, and I, I'm a very strong believer that, that that is one of the ways to, to move forward. And also many of the communities who have traditionally hunted uh, animals for years and, and, and traded this, you know, on, you know, don't understand the international implications of this. And they do see foreigners coming in, um, offering them lots of money. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in, in I won't say educating because that sounds patronizing, but informing the local communities that this is part of a wider chain, uh, an international chain um, that is increasingly powerful um, and able to penetrate not only local, but increasingly um, regional and national governments. Right now. <clears throat> thank you for your presentation, um, Jeremy, and thank you for your work. I'm Rowena Watson with the State Department. I'm here. Sure. I was saying thank you for your presentation and for all of your good work. I'm here. Um, I'm Rowena Watson with the State Department. I'm based in Washington. I'm here with the U.S. Dell, and I'm focused on crimes that affect the environment and combating wildlife trafficking, so I'm very sympathetic to um, your the, the statement that you made that environmental crimes should be elevated of in importance and pri prioritized to the level of drugs and and the work on um, combating transnational organized crime in the drug world how I I, um, I find that that that's a little bit of a difficult argument to sell and in, and how about comparing the numbers I guess the numbers involved the, the numbers are much better better or better the data on drug trafficking. Um, and the Im economic impacts from that, you know, when they talk about wildlife trafficking, timber trafficking, they they cite, you know, multi-billion dollars annually, and it's the fourth or third, or depending on how you count it, but drugs is always much higher. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what are some of the arguments for those who don't focus on this area to say that this should be better prioritized in terms of some of the economics impacts and, and where are you getting those figures from? I think the first thing, or anyway, is we're pushing on an open door with the South American nations. I think that they are tired of everything being put in counter narcotics terms and would be very keen to see the emphasis put on, on environmental crime. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that, that, that's a good thing. Uh, I think that we're pushing on an open door. Um, and as far as South America, as, as, the, as far as the political arena in South America is concerned, this is actually a no-brainer. Um, how, of course, we then persuade the rest of the international community is perhaps the slightly tougher issue. But again, attitudes are changing. I don't think, you know, um, I think climate deniers are, 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 are fewer and fewer. Um, and uh, I think the effects are more and more obvious. Um, and so I'm hoping that it isn't unreasonable to say the danger presented by environment crime should be at least equal to, if not supersede that presented by the consumption of, 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 of illicit drugs. So I'm hoping that, that this shouldn't be a discussion where we will receive a lot of pushback. But... That is more your world than mine, isn't it? But thank you for the question. Please, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Bia Zwango, and I'm the Secretary of State of Environment in Angola. Uh, uh, so I come uh, from one region with, has uh, got uh, second largest forest after uh, Amazon. It's Congo based forest. And basically, we do have many of 
the issues that you identified uh, in Amazon. Exploitation of gorillas. So now we are starting with the gold mines, mm -hmm. uh, oil mines. Mm -hmm. We are having also in, in, in that forest. Timber, of course. Uh, uh, and, and we do have one other additional which is the potential for regional conflicts. Mm -hmm. Many army groups moving around uh, around that forest. But in the same time uh, uh, that we, we can see that these, these movements are facilitated by the condition of, of the people. And my question to you is, in your assessment, did you try to identify the condition of life of those people that live in there? Because uh, sometimes they facilitate the crime or they hide the crime because from that they get something, mm -hmm. some revenue. Uh, and if yes, what are the measures that you identify uh, to overcome that, that situation? So I think you've hit one of the thorniest issues in, in all of this. Uh, and the, at the heart of it is, do we actually want people who were not born and grew up and communities native, do we want people in the heart of the Amazon or in your forests? What has happened, again, the uh, part of the invasion, for example, is the drug trade again. Most of the people involved were not native to these parts of the Amazon. They're called the colonos. They have colonized from other parts of Colombia or Venezuela or into, and they've cut into the jungle. And so they, it's an artificial environment. These aren't indigenous groups, and therefore these aren't indigenous economies. Uh, and many of the areas where this is ha where, where these are happening, of course, have been designated as nature reserves, which means you're not allowed to be in there. You're not allowed to engage in economic activity. You're not allowed to build roads. Um, and one of the challenges I think we have when we look at exactly what you're talking about, the communities in these areas who can make a good living, who most are living in absolute poverty or extremely poor conditions, and they can make money off this, is ideally we would like them to move out of the nature reserves and the protected areas and leave them intact. But this, of course, implies economic support, resettlement, and a variety of other complex um, issues that many governments don't have the, the resources to, to address. So um, we've certainly thought about it, but I'm afraid don't have an easy solution for you. Um, anybody else? Yes, sorry, I'm not sure who was first. I'll start with you, Madam, please. Um, Chloe Carpentier, sorry. Uh, I work at UNODC, I'm the Chief of Drug Research. And I wanted to uh, rebound a bit on what you say. I don't remember your name, sorry, from uh, the the State Department, <laughs> this I got right, mm -hmm. uh, about the, um, uh, whether we need to prioritize uh, the efforts against uh, drug trafficking and production or against uh, crime. I think there is an interconnection between the two also. And uh, uh, I hope you're aware, but you're not. Last year in the World Dog Report, we dedicated a full booklet to drugs and the environment, and we addressed uh, this issue. And we did also a, a study on in the Western Amazon, and uh, it shows that um, drug cultivation can be a driver of deforestation, but it's, it's not in most of the cases. In most of the cases, it's a catalyst, and basically the... the um, I would say the the funds that are generated by the drug trade will uh, will be used or in or through money laundering or whatever in cattle ranching or other activities that will uh, damage the environment and lead to more deforestation. So it's part also of development because where there was no road because it was in as you said in in remote areas that it was this illicit uh, coca cultivation. 
then uh, little by little you have roads and all of this and then you have community setting set learning and then this will uh, with little more deforestation so i think this is uh, something important there is a link eh, between the two and um what we what we say is that it's very important that uh, uh any policies on drugs also address the environment the event environmental sorry i'm french and it's a very difficult <laughs> word to say the environmental crime the environmental dimension sorry we also mentioned that for the alternative development uh, interventions which uh, uh, now I'm happy to say we will develop uh, guidance so that alternative AD uh, interventions also integrate uh, a segment of um, being mindful of the environment because not all of them are basically. So it's also in terms of responses, it's not only about eradication, the issue is also about other interventions. So I just wanted to bring that to the, to the picture and, uh, and say that we will follow up this year also in the World Hockey Report on, on these issues. This is something very interesting. Thank you for your very interesting yeah. presentation. Thank too. you. I think there's one thing to say here that crosses, say, timber, gold, and drugs, which is the communities that spring up around the extraction tend to have lots of money. And they also have a parallel currency. So if you're in a mining area, everyone gets paid in bits of gold. If you're in a coca area, you get paid in bits of coca base. And you know these are parallel currencies. Um, and the timber um, mafias, you know, they, they send their own little villages into the jungle. And this generation of money and the attraction of easy money creates these communities. And they can't be replaced by traditional agriculture because, of course, the coca farmer, the buyer comes to his house. You know, he doesn't have to, and so it's all very well, so why don't you grow pineapples? You go, well, tell me how I get my pineapple to the market, because it's 200 miles through the jungle. Um, so the whole notion of these illicit economies, not just drug trafficking, but around illicit, uh, in, uh, illicit environmental crime, are so lucrative and so artificial that you can't simply substitute them, even with the best will in the world. And that provides a huge, again, replies this issue of resettlement or, or not. I'm sorry, you were going to yeah. have a question. So uh, my name is Tim Berger. I'm with uh, IYSP. We're a youth global network. I'm one of the representatives here in Vienna. Uh, and we're currently in the process of defining our issues, but the environment is definitely one of our highest priorities currently. And uh, my question is, how can youth organizations, including IYSP in Latin America, uh, help uh, make the world aware of this and, and help as well. I think that's the most important issue of all is raising awareness. Um, and your generation, unlike mine, are far more aware of this, far more passionate uh, about this. Um, and of course, you guys vote. Um, and I think that much of the pressure for change will come from your generation. Um, now, how you best pass the message, you know that way better than I do. Um, but I, I firmly believe that that um, that uh, that youth and the younger generations are going to be instrumental, and they, in fact, are going to be what tips the balance in favour of of international response and action. So get to work. <laughs> we will. Um, I think we've um, we've run out of time. Um, I'm here. If anyone's got any follow up questions, thank you so much for coming, um, and please visit the website. Cheers. <clears throat>